Maori history. I mean, I teach history at Botany College in Auckland. I've never taken a history class in my life. I'm an honorary member of the Department of Psychological Medicine at Auckland University. I've never taken a class in psychology. But you don't need to be a weatherman to tell which way the wind is blowing. I don't have a background in Maori history, but when I went to the archives, I can read archives. I can interview people, and I know the difference between right and wrong. And to me, it's clearly just couldn't believe what was going on. And then you talk to some people, like I've talked to other teachers. I said, oh, I'm going out to Ibumata. I want to see what's going on out there. I want to talk to the people that are involved. I said, Ibumata, why don't they get a job? Why don't they? And this, these are other teachers. And to me, that's frustrating. And I think the way you do this, just like you have all these Black Lives Matter protests in the US, right? And they said, how are we going to fix this? More money for social work and this and that and the other thing? In my opinion, that helps, but it's not going to work. What works is, the problem is, you've got police officers who've grown up with a certain attitude in the US about people of color. And then they become police officers and they have a two-day training course on cultural sensitivity or race sensitivity. That doesn't cancel out their lifetime of stereotyping and biases that they've grown up with. I think it's the same here. I think it starts with education. It starts in kindergarten, in year one, two, three, genuinely. And it starts with educating the teachers as well to be respectful, and to know the history. I grew up in New York State. We had two years of New York State history. I had to know it. I think in primary school, they should know the history of this country, and there should be much more sensitivity in, in introducing the language as well as the culture. So look, I want to Thank everyone who's come out here today. I'm happy to try to answer any questions I can. Um, it was very frustrating, very frustrating. I contacted so many historians who did not get back to me. I contacted a number of Maori historians and even heads of departments of Maori at university. They were polite, but they didn't get back to me. With I said, look, I'm writing this book. I'm not an expert. Um, is there somebody who could write the book with me? And nobody was suggested. And I think to the Pakia, I'm some outsider. And so I represent a threat. They don't know me. Uh, maybe I'm not going to be sensitive. Or um, maybe I'm going to call their relatives racist. Well, back in the 1930s, pretty much everybody was racist because that's what they taught in schools. And for Mulry, I think it is... Well, here's just another pocky, a guy going to write in our history and twist it around. So I understand that. I'm not calling out historians or anybody. I'm just saying that's what happened. It is what it is. And, but nothing ever gets done without the help of others. I could not have done this without people like Bruce Ringer, without people from this library in particular, the Pukakoe Library. Um, different libraries around the, the archives, people like Leslie Smith, who did a, a fantastic study uh, in the 1980s on the segregation of housing um, in Pukekohe, people like Bernie Kierno, who wrote the book People of the Four Winds. Nobody does anything alone, and I want to acknowledge all of those people as well. And if anybody knows of anything that's wrong in the book, that's incorrect, I am more than happy to Corrected. I'm not aware at this point. No one's perfect. Um, I am looking for stories to put in a second book because I thought it would be a crime not to waste the stories people have been sending me. So I'm putting those into a second book. And I've also written, I've nearly finished a book for years uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10 in schools because I think there should be something there for them on the segregation period, in Pukekohe and then around the country. I think that's important as well. Um, so does anybody have any questions they, they'd like to ask me? We've got 
quite a few questions from uh, our friends on the internet if you want to take some. Sure, yep. Sure. Um, we've got um, uh, Conor who says, I grew up in Mokukaui. I've interviewed some locals in regards to the segregation. My question is, was the Mokukaui North area originally set aside for Māori and brown people only? I don't know. Maybe Bruce Springer can answer that. I, I can't answer that. I don't, I don't know. The answer is no. No. Thank you, Bruce. Um, someone commented, this sounds like apartheid South Africa. I would agree with that. Um, and uh, Pauline wants to know if you found any evidence of segregation within the churches. Um, well, I believe it's uh, Lori Guy who wrote um, a book called Shaping God's Zone. He has a small section in that book about the segregation of Pukekohe and the church at that time. And I want to personally thank him as well, because he looked over the manuscript for me. He gave me some really good uh, criticisms. Um, so now the apartheid, the thing is apartheid was legal. This was illegal. And I, I genuinely believe that most New Zealanders are offended by what happened. They're appalled by what happened. And they don't want to be defined by what happened. Or I mean, it makes the country look bad. And so I'm very mindful. Like, it probably didn't help me in a way that here's some guy with an American accent going down and interviewing people. And, um, but at the same time, I just think we should tell the story and make people aware of the story. But it's part of that story is Kiwis are very offended by this story. Most people would be, I believe. And um, it is part of our history. I think it, sh it just should be there, warts and all. It's very confronting, that's for sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, Karishma says that uh, we need to teach history as a priority. And I absolutely agree with you and say it's time to truly heal. <coughs> um, and uh, Pauline, who's in Australia, uh, wants to know can we buy a book from overseas? Because I have to say, you know, somebody said online, goes, oh, he just, he just cares about selling books. But what I did, my wife first of all, she goes, where's this money gone? We're, we're missing this money. I said, oh, I printed out 250 copies. She goes, no one's going to buy the book. Within six days, we had sold all 250 copies for my daughter putting it up on the website. And then there was the current events show on TV One did the um, did the segment. So we sold out in six days. We did well. Then I did another 250. Then I did 500. Now I just did not, I'm just doing 250 at a time. Um, we make very little. And anything I make, I put into the next 250. Um, I've made it so, number one, I'm not here to sell a book. Um, I've kept it under $20, I pay the GST and I pay the postage. The Australians, um, when it first came out, we probably sold 70 copies to Australians. And my daughter couldn't figure out the PayPal thing and we were, we lost probably $3 in every book we sent to Australia. But I did it. I, I want to get it out there. Now we figured it out. And um, so we're not losing money, at least on that. But we have, we've hardly made anything. And then that, I have to pay GST. I haven't paid yet. Um, that'll be on this coming year's taxes. Um, and it's just exhausting. Because I do it all, my daughter and I do it all ourselves. We um, get the, the mailers and we put the book in there. I sign every copy. The only copies I didn't sign is when I flew to a medical conference in Cuba right after the book was came out, right after I did that uh, uh, TV One interview. And um, those are the only ones that I, I didn't sign. But I, I, I just I want people to teach with, with the book. Yep. Yeah. We'll deal with some questions in that group now. So What's what's the one uh, Huya, uh, which I think publishes a Maori? I, I just remember getting the response: "We will not be publishing your manuscript." Um, I think 
No, no reason, but I think it's, um, I did have on the cover, um, and I think it's important to, um, I just want to make sure I got it right, um, I think it's important to say this, I've got how a generation of Maori children perished in the fields of Pukekohe. To me, that's confronting. It's not just they segregated people. It was deeper than that. And beyond that, it kills people's dreams, it kills their futures, if you're not getting an education. Um, so I think that was quite confronting. And I remember one of the major publishers was saying, you know, it's really interesting. Um, but we're worried that uh, it won't have a commercial interest. And it just took off. But I, I do think that when people see that, they, it rings alarm bells, or well, maybe people will find it offensive. I think it's meant to be offensive to a certain extent. It's meant to ring a bell that says it's just more than segregation. Serious stuff happened. And that's another reason why I'm here. Because I feel I'm a voice for the voiceless. I'm just, look, I'm just a messenger. I didn't live through this, but I can relate to it. Like, it's so powerful to me. It speaks to me as somebody who grew up on a farm, from a family of farmers. Um, it's just it's such a powerful message. All those children that died, who are unmarked graves, um, I feel I'm a voice for the voiceless, and that we should just, I, I want people to take this from me, and go, and I don't want to be the center of this. I want other Maori people, or Pakia, or whoever, to take this and go with it, and, and teach it. I've gone to the Maori Affairs Office. I haven't met the minister, I've met her handlers. And I gave them the first copy of the book. And um, I just think it's, it's up to us, isn't it? What is it Barack Obama said? Um, I wish Barack Obama were back. Um, <laughs> we are the change that we seek. It's up to all of us to speak up and write to your schools or your officials, and um, it's certainly not going to be some guy with an American accent doing it. I think somebody from here, people just just speaking up and speaking out. Um, it's such an important history that's been lost. And of course, the other aspect here that's so unusual that stood out was, when I first started asking history teachers about this, they said, oh, New Zealand has the best race relations with its indigenous population of any country in the world. And I started seeing that written as well. Most university lecturers view it as a myth. There's a lot of high school teachers that believe it's, it's real. It's something to aspire to, but it's a myth. I think we need to dispel that myth. And the, the best way to do it is through education at the grassroots through you and other people um, who advocate for this. I'm exhausted from, from doing the book and from just doing that second one there that's almost done, um, the, the one for the um, middle school students. And just every day shipping out more books. We were, we're averaging for this month 3.9 books a day. Um, and it just takes a lot of my time. Um, I would love for the if the education ministry wanted they can have this. I don't want anything for it. They can print it up themselves and distribute it to schools. Um, I would love to see, and my hope is that 
So many of the people I interviewed are in their late 70s, early 80s, early 90s. This generation will not be here forever. They have stories. I'd love to see around the country people teaching this and going out and sending the students out and interviewing their relatives and collecting those local stories before they're lost forever. That's my goal as a teacher. I think that's so important. It can be done. It just takes will. Uh, cool. well, thank you very much for your co-fo today. Um, to many Māori people, um, your story about Pukakohi is not unknown. Uh, for myself, personally, my father went to Wesley College in the 50s, and we knew from an early age that uh, he told stories that uh, when they'd go to the, the local cinema, that um, Māori were not allowed to, to sit at the top. Now, because he went to Wesley College, and in those days, quite different from was, there was very few Pacifica students there then. It was primarily Māori and a few Pākehā students. Because they went to a private school, the manager said to them, well, that's fine. Um, you, you can go upstairs, you can sit up there because you're privileged. Um, the boys responded to that and refused to go upstairs and sit there. But um, those stories of not being able to go to the bar are very, are very well known, and that Pukakoi always had a notorious reputation. Um, in, in my experience, I, I travel a lot as a young person going around in modern communities because the question I have to you is, in, in your research, it's why, why particular communities were probably worse than other communities. In my experience, traveling around filming Māori people uh, in the 80s and 90s, you go to certain areas and immediately you pick up from Māori community a lot harder resentment of Pākehā, the other Pākehā community. Some communities very, very intermixed and not so much resentment. Other Māori communities, I suspect Pukakoi would be the same. Um, the Māori had very poor um, perceptions of the Pākehā community, very poor relationships. In areas where they're predominantly Māori, if you went to, say, the Tuhoi, East Coast, the Western Hokianga, because Māori was so predominant there, you found often the, the, the relationships were better because Māori people were empowered more and had much more say in their local communities. It seemed to me travelling around that I noticed the areas I personally felt the resentment to most were areas like Pukakui, areas like southern Taranaki, areas like Matamata through to Tauranga. That's where I found Māori particularly very divisive between Māori and Pākehā communities. And if you look historically at that, a lot of those areas were key Rōpatu areas where they had a very troubled history of land grabs of Māori people being treated very, very poorly by the colonial government. And I, I always felt that there was a quite direct connection, historically, between the very... Um, some areas did not suffer Vopato as, say, the Taranaki people, the Waikato people, parts of Ngāpuri, etc. And I always felt there was a correlation between that. It seemed that the areas that had really suffered in some way more severe anger, that, that resentment was there. And in a way, um, you saw the Pākehā attitude to Māori was very really poor as well as a result. Uh, did you, is there anything in your findings around suggesting why Pukakoi? Because it is, no doubt, that's probably the most notorious of all the towns. I think, I don't know if you're too flashy Well, you but, know, I've tried to not overstep my bounds in terms of saying things that I, I'm not sure about. Um, but, of course, you have the um, that uh, stockade incident at the church from the 1870s. Um, and in fact, I don't want to keep calling him out, but uh, Bruce Ringer did some interesting research on that that suggests that it was uh, exaggerated in terms of the, the battle that took place. And um, there were certainly some hard feelings there in the community over that. Um, and it does look like um, that incident was quite glorified um, from the European perspective. Well, it wasn't the pathway. It's on the path from Walker through to... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, what, you, what you've said there makes a lot of sense. Um, that's why you know, I would have loved to have uh, written a book with, uh, with a historian. Well, what I can say is, what I have done, I am confident that what I've written about is, is accurate. But because I don't have the historical depth of knowledge that a historian would have, um, there are insights like that that I haven't really gone into. I've really focused on Pukakoe 
and then the segregation era in general, uh, with a lot of help from the government documents from around 1960-61. There's one confidential document in particular that was very, very helpful. Um, but thank you so much for that. That's really interesting. Um, I have a question from uh, our internet friends. Um, um, Karishma says, as an educator in New Zealand who has taught internationally, it shocked me that I was able to teach here without being given um, PD in Māori history. So that's a good point. Uh, and Cherish says, when writing this book, do you feel like there was adequate engagement and consultation with local iwi? And do you think that these perspectives have been accurately represented? And has this been published with iwi support? Um, no. And let me tell you what. Well, let me tell you what I did. Um, I went and collected the documents. Then I went and interviewed the Maori in the Pukekohe area. To a person, they they all knew what I was doing. And they all wanted the story told. So I wrote the story. Um, I'm not, I'm pretty ignorant in terms of, and maybe I can get away with certain things because I have an accent, but I'm not really familiar with that aspect of New Zealand culture about going to the Ely and ask permission. But I did tell the people there what I was doing. Whether you accept this or not, I have strong feelings about that. I believe that history is what happens. And nobody owns history. I believe that history is something that happens and we try to record it to the best of our ability. And, um, but I will tell you this, if anybody had come up to me and said, Robert, this is really bringing back bad memories. And some people did say that, but they wanted me to do it. If they said, this is bringing back bad memories, I don't want you to write this, doubt that I would have written it. But they all wanted me to write it. And so now for the second book, not the one for the uh, schools, but the second, um, Mo Maury Allowed Two, I can't claim that I don't know any better because people have told me. So now I went to the Natai Tama Oho office and I met with them, and I told them what I'm doing, and I asked for their help and their permission. And if they say no, then I won't do it. But if they think it's helpful and useful, then I'll do it. I'm not gonna do something against somebody's will. Although, and I feel strongly about this as an outsider, like I think somebody, I don't think anybody owns history. History are things that happen. The problem has been in the past, the people that have owned the history, history is written by the winners, right? The winners have been the Pacquiao, and then they've written twisted histories, from what I can see. I mean, not quite accurate. Um, people might feel upset about that, but I, I just feel that I don't think anybody owns history. But I'm not gonna go and do somebody's family history. I mean, that's your history. Your family history, your micro history, or, but I mean, in terms of the broad stroke events that have happened, I think that belongs to everybody. Um, but again, I'm not going to do it if they don't want me to do it. I'm just, I'm not going to do it. Um, just being honest, and I think some people might have a problem with that. I've gotten some emails from people that seem to have a problem with that and say that I have no right to write in somebody else's history. I, I don't agree. I don't think you own a history. I don't think Europeans own their history. I think anybody can write on a history. However, I'm not going to go into somebody's community and start interviewing people if they don't want me there. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. But again, everybody that I interviewed in Pukekohe wanted me to, to do the book. They knew what I was doing and they gave interviews freely to me. Um, Timothy, Timothy says, why do you think New Zealanders look past this racist history and pretend they're not racist? Yeah, I, thank you so much. I just think that um, most Kiwis today uh, wouldn't consider themselves racist, 
I think they're, they're sensitive, but there is a group, there is a certain percentage that are bigoted, that are narrow-minded, and um, how do you weed that out? You weed it out from year four and five in school, and you address it there, because kids are mirroring what their parents are saying so often. Um, I just think it begins with education, and it ends with education. You know, we, we, and we're always learning. I mean, I don't know everything. Uh, my favorite saying, um, I never call myself doctor. I, I, um, if I thought I was smarter than anybody else in the room, I would. My favorite saying is, if I am nothing without a PhD, then I, I'm nothing with one. I mean, I'm, I'm just, just a person trying to write a history um, because I feel, I taught history at, at our school for several years, and every year it's the same thing, Montgomery Bus Boycott, 1955, 1956, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, great, but I'm in New Zealand. I love to teach about Pukekohe and the racial segregation era, and I think we can do that and then say, look how far we've come. And we were not, we're not, we're not painting everybody out to be racist, but um, this did happen, we should acknowledge it and learn lessons from the past. Sure, sure. I think we've got one more question. I think yeah. We, yeah. Okay. And then we might wrap it up. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I had a quick question because you mentioned um, how far New Zealand is from. I'm clearly not born here. I was also born in the U.S., born in Philadelphia. Yep. Um, but I moved here from Berlin, which was super diverse, which I experienced. In. Can and I ask how long you've been here for? Uh, three years. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I actually get a lot of prejudicial comments to me here, a lot of racism that I experience here being a um, commercial business owner and private label owner. Um, I, re I receive that racism from different forms. It's not just Pacquiao, Eurocentric, New Zealand people. I get a lot of racism. Actually, I get here the most of them from Maori people. So, so what would be an example? On my third day of moving here, I was called the N-word to my face by a Maori guy. And uh, my fifth day living here, walking through Brutomar, I was called the C-word from a Eurocentric Kiwi guy. So my comment to you would be, you're saying something that was very long ago, something that's actually here in Preston, is something here, there's six schools here um, that don't allow people to have Afro hair, locks, or braids. And I re remember you mentioning, not wanting to mention the school, but I will, because I'm not the book writer, but Auckland Grammar is one of those and they don't allow you to have Afro hair, braids or locks, because they believe that it looks unprofessional otherwise. Where does that leave Pacifica people or African or Caribbean people that naturally curly hair, such as myself? And um, I think that it speaks to a lot of people don't like being called what they are or prejudices or biases that they do hold. And I think it's easy for people to point a finger. So I think it's really awesome that you were able to write this book. But I think there is a lot of things that Kiwis do hold on to, so maybe the, you know, it's illegal. You were saying it wasn't illegal, but it's still legal here to tell people, like for myself, to find where to get my hair. People tell me, oh, we don't do hair like yours. I still experience that here in Auckland. Or maybe you should go to K World. There's an African shop there. I've heard that all the time. So that's something. And then the other point I wanted to ask you about being from the States, how do you feel about 100% Kiwi owned? This is a comment that I'm asking because I'm a business owner and I would never put on any of my businesses here 100% African American owned. I've never been in a Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Are, are, are you a New Zealand citizen now? No, not, no, no. Okay, because that'd be a great comeback. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm a Kiwi, right? Because we're all, because there's Kiwi isn't a color. Kiwi isn't a ethnic group, is it? Um, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Yeah. And I, I would guess, based on my 10 years here, that everybody in this room, most people at least, would feel aghast by what happened to you. I'm really sorry that that happened. Um, but that does speak to the need, I think, to, and I've noticed at some schools that it's still, the, the N word is still commonly used. And um, I think that's something we need to address and, and learn about. Um, and it's all, it's all different ethnic backgrounds that I mean, like starting in year four or five. Um, but that's really interesting. 
and I took some notes there as well. As you know. um, thank you so much for that. What was your uh, the kiwi on thing? Oh, the ki the kiwi on. I was asking about that because I've never usually when that's mentioned because people tell me kiwi, and normally when people say kiwi, they're referring to Euro kiwis, and then people say kiwi or Maori. So when people say that when they're buildings, when they say 100% kiwi owned, it's never usually owned by a Pacifica born or Maori. Um, Kiwi. It's normally a Euro Kiwi that's putting it, and I want to know what would your. Well, I saw a lot of that when I used to live. I'm sorry, in Australia. I lived in Australia for a number of years, and uh, you saw Australian owned or 100% Australian owned. That was a big thing, uh, and of course with with Donald Trump in America, you know the big thing is now American owned, right? It's all American. Um, yeah, I just think that um, we're all in this together with different ethnic groups and backgrounds and um, cultural diversity. Um, I just think it's fantastic, the culture. Look, I, I'm looking out here today uh, for the cultural diversity I see. I think it's fantastic, and I think that's the future. I think, um, yeah, I don't know what my opinion on it is other than I don't like American owned or America first. I think, you know, we live in a global community today, and we need to get along with everybody and, and try to better understand each other. I'm so thankful for your comments there. That, that's, that really contributes to the debate, I think, discussion. And I'll follow up on some of that as well. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah? Well, um, I think that um, it's been fantastic. Um, Thank you so much. We've learned, well, I've learned a lot about our past. It's quite horrifying and confronting to hear those things and um, you're obviously very passionate about the topic as well so um, we're very grateful that you've come to share your research with us. I'm here to and learn from you as well, that's why I was taking notes because I certainly don't know everything and um, that's for sure, I ask my wife and kids, I'll tell you. Yeah. Um, so I just want to say thank you and thank you for your, for your time. Thank you very much. chat with anybody that wants to talk afterwards. Um, I don't know if leave the room.